the the moral of this episode there we go is is that we don't need to hide our problems with jesus on our side because he has covered all of our sins and we don't oh my goodness someone mute him please <laughs> did you say someone i know mute i know him? i'm sorry <laughs> hello there don't have a good day have a great day talk to me goose you steal the Declaration of Independence. Fly, so sail, world. I could do this all day. Are you watching closely? Welcome, everybody, to the One Eyed Film Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Mossberg, and today we are changing the past. No. Okay. <laughs> Are no, you? we're talking. No, we're talking about was it better the first time around, or should we change it? I don't really know what the theme is directly, but we have a bunch of different aspects to talk about because in not even recently, just in the past of of Hollywood, there has been a, a lack of satisfaction with how movies are released or even content is released. We'll talk about why we mean more than movies and more than TV shows. Things being changed after their release. There's an official release, and then they're changed in some way after that, and why? We may get a little dramatic but we're also it's not that big of a deal this isn't like a morality thing but there is some why some understanding as to why it is the way it is and why, why it's acceptable and we got some different perspectives on it and we got josh and deacon here to talk about it so hi guys i don't know why i'm here <laughs> like on the podcast or just in this world well in this world but also in this podcast i mean the fact of the matter is i thought i did a bad enough job with the outro of the last one i was in that i thought i would never be invited back and yet seth texts me and he's like i need views on an episode so can you join I was like, why not man why not i forgot about the eternal outro bit uh, you can't do that today we're in a time crunch okay yeah yeah <laughs> oh i don't want to think about that <laughs> so the more i research this the more i realize that it's been a thing to change media for the better part of like 50 years i think the most popular examples of this is like star wars especially a new hope but also a couple times throughout the other movies i believe a new hope was more because george lucas made the movie and then released it and realized he would actually want to change things now that some money is being raked in then there are also anniversary specials that come out with a lot different a lot of things changed there's things like from the original jabba was not an alien he was a, he was a man in a big fur coat and that was a little weird that's that's one of the things that you like point to to show you didn't know that, Josh? No, I. Yeah, I'm not a super Star Wars fan, that's so fair, I don't know fair. tons about it. But no, when it first released, Jabba was a man or a, a humanoid in a big fur coat, and they added in a very bad CG Jabba soon after the movie was released. And then they even you can see even now, even with the best remastering with Disney at the helm, they, they it's still you can still see the weird shifting of Han walking over his tail because initially there wasn't a tail there, so it like they cut him out and make him like stutter up over Jabba's tail. And then they then I believe with the 10, 20th anniversary, twenty fifth anniversary, they made a new and improved Jabba CGI creature. And there are things like that, including the Han shot first. That's the whole debate of who shot first is changing that over the years and deciding one would shoot first, one would have the reaction time. It was, you know, people going frame by frame to decide that. And it was stupid little fan <laughs> theories, but that's the type of stuff that Star Wars was kind of known for. After you get through the, the amazing story and the amazing visuals, it then is like, well, why wasn't this the same? Why, why is Hayden Christensen in a movie that came out like two years after he was born. And and why is the emperor in here when in, originally he looked like a, a dead raisin and things like that. But then I, as I started to research these, there was a lot more that uh, a lot more changes made to very popular franchises. Blade Runner apparently had a lot. I haven't watched Blade Runner. It's literally like a save tab on my computer right now because I want to watch it. Blade Runner has apparently been changed a lot. Lord of the Rings has a few changes. It's more common than you would think. E.T., back when E.T. released, their cops chasing the kids had guns, and then they realized that's a little harsh. So let, then they put CGI walkies in their hands instead. And so things like that. So we think it's a new phenomenon, but it's not. So I, that's why I don't want to say it's wrong because it's been been here almost as long as movies have been around. 
Yeah, and there's also been instances where, like, a movie has changed while it's still in theaters, like, mm -hmm. as it's being released. Like, I only think of one example for this, but No Way Home, where there's the portal scene that was changed and a few other CGI stuff that was changed just to help the, the ebb and flow of the movie. And it's it's not something that's that's frowned upon because everyone appreciated the change there but it's it's when you are changing major major aspects to the story mm -hmm. like possibly remakes too which is something i think we'll talk about here lion king for example is that something that you do a whole remake going into live action versus just changing a few parts of the story or something like that as i was thinking about this episode and kind of my perspective on it the way I see it is the release date to me doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot, and I'll get to where I think it becomes a problem. But it's not as if when these movies were being created, the script was approved, the first script got approved, and the directors took the first take of every scene, and the animators didn't go through a few trials of a few different options mm. that they had for their thing. So to me, when an artist is painting on a canvas or a writer is writing a chapter they'll go through revisions to make their message clearer and convey what the artist intended the audience to experience better and so to me just because a piece of art got released does not mean that the artist has to be done making their art be everything that it can be now I will challenge that often it's not done very well and actually hinders the art, but we'll get onto that later. But I don't think there's anything that says this is the cutoff. The art has to stop arting here. <laughs> yeah, I I hear what you're saying, but I think you're I think movies are one of the only things that can be changed after their release. Are, are there books that have been edited after they've been released? Are there is there music that has been edited after its release? Paintings. You brought up paintings. Have there been paintings that have been changed after they've been put up for display? I don't know. I almost guarantee you there have. Well, the Webster Dictionary is on, what, the 50th version? <laughs> now, say what you want about Taylor Swift, and this is, a, a, this is not this is not a one-to-one -one parallel, but, I mean, she does have her whole Taylor's version thing, which is a slightly tweaked... Now, that's a whole different thing about, like, the copyright and the label mm -hmm. yeah. or how... Yeah whatever the politics of that whole thing were. But the fact of the matter is she didn't exactly do them. She's tweaked the lyrics here and there throughout the whole thing to change. I was talking to someone the other day. I have barely listened to any Taylor Swift, so this is all secondhand. <laughs> but what I've heard is that she changed a lot of lyrics that she thought were immature. Specifically, I remember hearing there was this breakup song where in the original she was very degrading to the woman that her boyfriend cheated on. And she revised those lyrics when she released Taylor's version of that song because she, looking back at it through more mature eyes, she realized that the girl didn't have as much blame as maybe younger Taylor thought she did. And she's a feminist now, so she decided we can't be calling girls words like this. <laughs> so she tweaked that. As far as books, I can't say for certain, but have you ever heard of a second edition of a book or a reprint? I guarantee you there's right. dozens of books that have gone through edits through the reprints, second editions. Even board games have errata. Only book that I know of is like the the Bible that has like New English Standard version, English Standard version. That's all I'm That's thinking about. That's not the same. That's not the same at all. The message I think is a remix of the Bible. But that's a whole other topic. But no, I can't uh, think of any books that have had changes. I think you do bring up a good point with the different editions. Usually, I think of those as more informational books and needing to be updated over time because of outdated or new information. I I was thinking more of storybooks because they're very different ways of consuming. And they're different types of media. One is informational and learning. One is one is a, a story. There is there is like remixes or like changes of the story like from from fairy tales. I think of of Cinderella or Sleeping beauty where the original books or the original stories are actually a lot more messed up than what the actual one is and then when it was once it was put into a storybook or something like that it was changed a lot 
but I don't even know if that's what we're talking about. Well, we are because we were going to talk about unnecessary sequels or remakes because there are, take Peter Pan, for example, there is probably a really morbid original story that was made back in the 1800s about Peter Pan who could fly. He was a child who would never grow up. And then there's maybe a story written about that, like finalized in a book. And then Disney bought the rights to that and made the cute little children's movie about it. And then that's kind of what everyone thinks of as the original animated Disney movie. And that's the good version. So then when Disney takes its own media and makes it live action, whether it's Peter Pan and Wendy or Hook or any of the other versions of it. It's garbage. <laughs> Why do we frown upon those instead of frowning upon the original, which was a plagiarism or a version that changed the original original? You know what I mean? Because they actually did something with the property. There's okay. two pitfalls in my mind with remakes, and they're both on opposite sides of the spectrum. Aristotle talks about, you know, the Aristotle and Plato talk about the golden mean between two extremes, where mm. they say often you have basically a sin on both sides, and virtue is in between the two. On the one side, you have a remake that adheres too closely to the original, and it's like a shot-for-shot -shot remake. And then on the other side, you have ones that take too many creative liberties and lose the heart of the original. Mm -hmm. Mulan, for example. Yeah, yep, just like Mulan. And here's where my perspective ultimately comes down to, is art is a rendering of an art artist's imagination and it's what the artist wants you to feel right a comedy they want the audience to laugh and feel lighthearted. an emotional drama the director wants you to feel something and so as i said before i think as long as the revisions and remakes to the art are trying to encapsulate the artist's vision better than the last version did then i think that there's a place for revisions within the art if the remake adheres too closely to the original. They aren't actually improving on the art. They're not making the art all that it can be. They're not getting any closer to the potential that that story has with a shot-for-shot -shot remake. And in fact, I would challenge they're making it worse for two reasons. Firstly, a shot-for-shot -shot remake that changes genres, let's say the live-action ones. I would say that instead of saying the same story but the same, they're doing a disservice by changing from animation to live action. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of the genre of the animated Disney movies. Is I think actually the animation, they chose animation specifically to tell those stories because that's what they chose. And so everything they did within those movies had animation in mind. So then when you try to translate that to live action, it just does not translate well in a one-to-one -one thing. Secondly, is that since these are classics that are being remade that everyone knows and loves the sequel that you make that is just the same as the original will never make the audience feel the same way they did when they first watched the original and that's a problem will smith i think did a pretty good job as the genie in the remake i enjoyed his performance but the problem is i heard a lot of people didn't like his performance the problem is they kept comparing him to robin williams in my opinion and that sucks for will smith because will smith is will smith he'll never be robin williams and mm -hmm. that's just the reality. But it's when you come into a remake with the expectation that it's going to be like the original, and then it's not. And it's not giving you the same feeling. It's not giving you the same experience the original did. You will inevitably end up disappointed in the retelling. Toby Fox, the creator of Undertale, actually has a quote that I pulled up here in regards to Deltarune, his sequel. And then there was like some questions about what it was going to be like and how it related to Undertale. And he had to say this, if you played Undertale, I don't think I can make anything that makes you feel that way again. However, it is possible that I can make something else. And I think that's kind of the general feeling where it's like the director made something that made you feel a certain way. And there's no way you can make them feel that way again. But the director might be able to make you feel something else. But we're not exploring that something else. We're just trying to make audiences feel the way they did when they were a kid. Get that nostalgia bait going. I think especially in today's day and age, when you have something that 
is fun and you enjoy, you want to have that play again and again and again and again as much as you can. Like a movie, for example, I would do so much to try and go back and watch Infinity War for the first time again with all of you guys in the theater, but that's just never going to happen. And I think all of these new remakes or something are just trying to, I've, we've talked about it multiple times, but play into that nostalgia, try and get you to feel as though, as though you're watching something like that for the first time again, when in reality, you just got to try and make us feel something different that can have the same level of excitement or or sadness even or whatever kind of emotion the artist is trying to get you to feel get that sort of level of emotion again just through a different method and especially marvel disney a lot of hollywood that's trying to do with all of these remakes they're trying to just show you the same movie hoping that you have the same reaction that you did the first time mm -hmm. and you're, you're just never gonna do that like i think of remakes that are not necessarily remakes like you know me video games i love video games like assassin's creed it's all the same game it's and <laughs> truthfully i don't think i'll ever feel the same way for any of the new games like i did for assassin's creed black flag which was the first one that i ever played i don't think i will just because they're all just way too similar and the same now some may be slightly better than others but it's i think repetition especially when it comes to movies and unoriginality is killing hollywood because nothing is enjoyable anymore because we're just feeding ourselves the same stuff i think what you're saying is along the same lines of what i thought of when i was watching dial of destiny and a number of other legacy sequels that have come out because of how bad it is it's just reminding me of how good the originals were and i would just rather be watching mm -hmm. the raiders of the lost ark instead of dial of destiny like yeah it's trying to recreate the same adventure of indiana jones mm -hmm. and the same mm -hmm. excitement but it's just not it's it's trying to copy it in a poor way and and leaving you not feeling filled and and some people don't really realize that what they need is not the exact same thing or that feeling like josh you said you would love to have the infinity war feeling or the, even the end game feeling yeah. all over again but it's going to come in a different way it's not going to come it's probably not going to come through marvel unless they do it a better which is up for debate right now but i don't even know if it's possible if, there's if hope for there's marvel a little bit of hope that. zach and i would is say there's there? a little bit of hope a little bit it's not a lot but especially when you start talking about literal sequels does it improve the story or does it add to the story sorry i'll split that up sequels direct sequels should be an addition to the story if you're going to remake it for whatever reason it needs to improve the story and a lot of people would say that a lot of things being remade are improving the story because they're throwing in a little bit of diversity equity and inclusion and they're taking out plot points that are outdated or so they say they're outdated things like that that i would say aren't necessarily improving the story they're just filtering more they're filtering the, the original mm -hmm. and making it acceptable and then remaking it so they can make more money off of it and i think mm -hmm. the streaming services have really really not helped for for two reasons one disney started putting a content warning on the original peter pan because of how they portrayed the native americans back in that movie that's not necessarily the conversation i want to to go down but that content warning can now be placed before anyone sees it and and starts to formulate how you're going to watch this movie. The other way that streaming services have kind of ruined this is two examples that I have is The Mandalorian and Falcon and Winter Soldier. Not the not the stories or the shows specifically, but in The Mandalorian, I believe in season 2 there was a scene where Mando and his friends are fighting in in a against droids I believe or stormtroopers and you a lot of people saw around a corner was a dude in blue jeans and a t-shirt and they <laughs> they started calling him blue jeans guy I believe and it 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 took the internet by storm for a while because it was a, it was a crew member who what didn't get completely out of the shot and everyone saw it you would go to Disney Plus and you would find it. Only about a day or two later, you could not find it on Disney Plus because they had gone in and digitally removed that that leg, that pant leg, just from that shot because it's on a streaming service. Even if it wasn't a movie, that would have been not that hard either because we've seen No Way Home changed. There was somebody who noticed that Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, his portal was changed midway through being released in theaters. Thor Love and Thunder, apparently the floating head CGI was changed but not fixed, like it still looks pretty bad. Things like that. So it, not not necessarily that it's streaming or that it's a movie that that changes that but also in falcon winter soldier there was an action scene that was changed 
again, I guess they're both action scenes, but they're different reasons. Mandalorian was a crew member that wasn't out of sight. Falcon and Winter Soldier, I believe, they were fighting in a bunch of cargo area or, or with, with cargo boxes everywhere. And somebody, I don't remember, it was probably one of the heroes, threw like a metal pipe and it hit somebody in the shoulder and pinned them to one of the, one of the boxes. And apparently they changed that so that it just bounced off of her and she just got sent back. The, the stunt woman got sent back instead of being pinned. So that's more of a of a content control of, of making sure it's acceptable. It's things like that that give, now that streaming is out, gives the option to change it, specifically with streaming stuff on the fly. Like it just takes somebody to open up the project file, change it, and then throw it back up. It's like a YouTube upload. It's super easy. And it's, it's a little bit of laziness, I would say, to not decide those things. One of them is mis that mistakes are made. There's a whole website, I believe, called Movie Mistakes, where you find content Continuity mistakes and and people holding different objects and things like that that are it's kind of fun to watch like it, you understand that it's not a flawless movie or a flawless show but sometimes it's just a lack of proof watching in that sense i believe that blue, blue jeans guy could have been caught <laughs> caught and brought to justice <laughs> but yeah. or deciding that the falcon and winter soldier scene that and i believe there was also a scene with a lot of blood that they decided to change to be less bloody that they should have decided beforehand instead of going back and change again so it's that's more along the lines of what i brought up with star wars of changing things because i think it'll it should improve that's less of a sequels discussion and more of will will this change improve the story talking about all those like star wars specifically did all the changes george lucas made improve the story or just that he felt he wanted to yeah i think making changes too it's very easy to see what the motive of making these changes is is it mm. to make yourself look better is it to push an agenda is it to actually create some art or is it to make more money there's mm. probably tons of other motives that studios and producers nowadays can can have to put out more content new content or edit content that's already out but you just gotta focus on the art that's what filmmaking is seth you have a degree in animation you know <laughs> that it is it is an art and there's a lot of times where you no longer treat it as an art you treat it as business or you treat it as as just another paycheck yeah i'll also say you can see it as as, as a creative you can see it as your baby as as something that you need to make perfect even yes deadlines mm -hmm. are a thing and that's been something that has pushed me to get it done to completion before the project is done. I'm thinking specifically of college where I hated deadlines, but then I would get to like 12 hours before it was due. And I was like, it needs to be perfect. But there wasn't an option in school to, to change it after it was submitted. Things like that, where you just need to have a, a understanding that it is what it is. You've done all you can. You've done the best you can. Now move on. I'm thinking more of assignments, but at the same time, making sure it's done. Josh, I wanted to talk about video games. And I think Deacon even oh brought it word. up a while now, ago when we were thinking about talking about this episode where there have been games specifically i think of cyberpunk that oh were word. released to be terrible they, they were terrible no one liked it they were like you spent this long making it it costs this much money and it's an unfinished game yeah and they put it off so many times yeah and then they're like oh there's a patch coming there's bug fixes that will make that will fix it later but it's like no give us a whole game and they used to you used to be able to do that when you would only be able to ship dvds like yes you could there's a time where there was dvds and content updates but for the for the early years of video game history you just had to buy the finished game yeah it's notorious for quite a few studios when a game comes out you don't really want to buy it for a solid month until it's actually playable i think of battlefield yeah. for example that's a game that has tons and tons of bugs and stuff when it first comes out and then maybe a month later it's a little bit more playable or i think of studios that have also just committed to a game either being unfinished or super buggy i think of skyrim for a, for a huge example there's so many bugs in some of those games that just don't get fixed and i think the the question between also just movies as well is is a mistake worth going in to fix now for mm. video games if it's a bug i think yeah, you should definitely go in and make sure that my character doesn't go flying from walking across a bridge or something <laughs> like that. Bridge physics. Red Dead Redemption 2 is what I was thinking of there. I, oh. <laughs> I, very specific glitch that I'm thinking of. But 
<laughs> or stuff that, like, in video games, you can have glitches that take away from the true purpose of the game, like I think of Elden Ring. There's quite a few, what do you call it, cheese strategies, where you can get past a boss that's supposed to be super difficult because of this glitch or this method, and you press this button at the right moment and you'll get past them. It's taking away from the true purpose of the game, and I think fixing something like that is urgent because the art isn't being appreciated for the way the art is supposed to be appreciated. And mm -hmm. I think the same way for movies, like if there's some horrible movie mistake that's in the movie or in the TV show that's taking away from the art, from the ability to watch the film, yeah, change it. Although mm -hmm. I don't think Blue Blue Jeans guy fell under that under that category. I don't think it took yeah. away from it. Now, if there was a line that just didn't work at all and it, it didn't make sense to the plot or this or that, yeah, I think it's awesome for you to change it, but I don't think change should be so quick because if you really thought it out and you took pride in your work, like you were saying, Seth, like it's your baby. If you take pride in your work and you put it out and you're proud of it, going to be so much more refined than if you were just trying to put it out so that you could check it off of the assignments page or just make sure you're reaching a deadline. It's okay to push back deadlines. Like Cyberpunk, I was okay with them pushing it back so many times. Now, did it come out as a full game? No, not at all. <laughs> but was I okay with them pushing it back because I wanted a full game? Yes. Same with stuff like Arcane or Invincible or or Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse or the the Beyond, Beyond the Spider-Verse Spider is what it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. I'm okay with them pushing it back because I want the art to be fully developed. I want it to be there, and I want it to be good. I don't care about time. I just want it to be good, and I don't want it to have some of those mistakes to where I have to wait a month to actually enjoy the art for what it's truly worth if they don't put it out finished. Just wait for when uh, movies are going to get day one patches. <laughs> day, <movie. laughs> day one patches. <laughs> Uh, Dude, where crazy. where I mean, the third day it's in theaters is actually the busiest, not the first. That's yeah. Well, I mean, this, I I think part of the problem with the game industry, and obviously we can blame and point fingers at the game industry as much as we want, but the fact of the matter is, why wouldn't they release? A buggy glitchy mess to be honest because at this point instead of paying play testers to find bugs mm. in their game we're paying them to find the bugs and glitches in their game like why are we supporting companies that are releasing half finished games like because they just keep getting away with it and then they can <laughs> fix their game and they know the community will still be there to play the game by the time it's fixed mm. yes and no because <laughs> Actually, I say, I'll agree with you there because I know a lot of Call of Duty people who really hate all of the bugs and the lack of anti-cheat systems and everything that comes with playing Warzone and other other Call yep. of Duty products, and yet they'll still play it. For some reason, they still have a commitment to never leave that game, no matter how many bugs, no matter how many hackers. So yes, you are right. And I think that might be a business strategy. Yes, you definitely want to play test a little bit. People are going to, especially with the speedrunning community, trying to find glitches and everything, that's going to be a lot more valuable and technically for free, if not them paying for the game and you making, or the developers making a profit because of how the internet has formed over the last couple of years of trying to find these glitches. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's talking about video games specifically. I think it's still a little irresponsible to release unfinished games as bad as like cyberpunk yeah there's a line and you just can't cross it yeah there's also the other side of it where games like lethal company have tons of glitches but it's so much fun and people mod it into a way that makes it even more enjoyable that then it's it's just okay to really not that the creator of lethal company was trying to make a complete high resolution quadruple a game but still there there's bugs and people just kind of accepted it they didn't demand they didn't demand an update but things like that i mean so from that perspective then we're not we're not criticizing the remake of art that's making the art better for lack of a better mm. word i call it greed but it is making <laughs> the art better as I said earlier, there's two sides of the coin. There's the uh, making media that's shot for shot, like basically identical to the original. But then let's talk about the converse side. What happens when 
remakes completely change and botch the original. Now, from my perspective, the main problem with this is an artist at some point poured their blood, sweat, and tears into this art. Now, you can say what you want. It can be dated. It could have ideas that we don't agree with anymore. But in remaking this art and changing what the art looks like and trying to put your own agenda and modern ideas into this product, you are fundamentally changing the art and changing the painting to fit your frame. Now, I think that I don't like this from a conceptual standpoint where I think that philosophers, right, have built on the ideas. Isaac, sir, I was a, who has the quote, was it Sir Isaac Newton about standing on the shoulders of giants? But essentially, every generation gets the information of the previous generation, and we're able to advance further beyond that. Music evolves off of other music. You know, they talk about who are the most influential musicians or artists. They're the most influential because they influence people to expand and grow and change and branch off into different directions and show people the possibilities. And I think of the beauty that a lot of these original classics have made and the stories they've told. And then that's inspired a whole nother generation of artists and writers and animators to come up because they were inspired by this art. And I think how sad it is that this next generation of artists are being forced to remake art that's already been made. How many writers and animators who have a real passion and talent for this are wasting their time remaking art that has already been made instead of pushing the genre forward, instead of pushing art forward and making the next generational piece that's going to inspire the next generation of animators, right? Are the kids of today going to be inspired by the live action Lion King or are they going to be inspired by the original Lion King? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Which, mm -hmm. which one? Are we going to have two generations inspired by the same stuff because this generation is doing nothing to push cinema forward? The fact of the matter is, at one point in our history, people thought that TV was going to be a fad that would mm -hmm. die off. And I think that's a, that was a stupid take, but whatever. <laughs> Some people thought it. And I don't... TV's obviously going nowhere. And so the question is, is it TV going to remain stagnant forever? I don't think it will. But right now, we... Not very many people in AAA, big budget Hollywood are moving the genre of TV forward. Mm -hmm. I think that conversely... I think in the on the video game side of things, indie developers are pushing the game industry forward. They're showing that with a small budget, people don't need $60 mega experiences to have a good time. They'll go <laughs> buy a $20 game that they'll play for a few hours with their friends and just have a blast. They don't or need a thousand. this tr or a thousand. They don't need this AAA experience to have a good time. And I think that a lot of the innovation in the game scene is coming from these indie developers. And I think that at some point, either Disney and other big movie companies are going to have to start innovating themselves, or younger filmmakers are going to start innovating. Because someone's got to innovate to move it forward, because otherwise I don't think the consumer is going to stand for it. I think there's definitely exceptions to the artists of movies nowadays pushing the genre forward. I think of the new Puss in Boots. That was great. That was really pushing mm -hmm. art forward, and it was even a sequel, which usually sequels don't have the biggest or the best rep. But then you also have... The Spider-Verse series, you know I'm I'm a suckler for those. Or I guess those are the Arcane. only two. Oh, yeah. Arcane, Invincible, those two as well. And there's quite a, like, Knives Out, Glass Onion, that was also great. There's stuff that's being put out, but it feels so far and few between as it used to be. Like, mm -hmm. Marvel used to be the biggest thing that everyone was going to see every year. Or, or so many other movies, like Star Wars used to be really big, but some of the biggest companies and some of the biggest names have really fallen off of a cliff in just being good at creating good art because they're just trying to redo the same art. And I think games have definitely taken a huge leap. I think of games like Stray that were just small indie developers mm -hmm. that were huge, winning, almost winning game of the year in just such a small budget, small games and stuff like that, that did so well. And 
there's people out there that are putting out amazing stuff and some truly cool stories, art, whatever you want to call it. There's good stuff out there, but it's just you got to look for it now because mm -hmm. of these the copy and paste dilemma yeah. right now. I do want to say something about the arcane style or the, the painterly style that has been popular recently. Yeah. That is becoming a problem in and of itself. Arcane, yep. I believe, pushed it first and into the Spider-Verse. I believe they were kind of came out at the same time. They were both in production at the same time for sure. But then you saw things like Wish and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other things start using that style. And that's now become normal, even though it's still cool. I said a couple, mm -hmm. many episodes ago, I said, I don't want that to become the normal. I want that to still be rare and, and, and be cool without being commonplace. So we don't want that to happen. Once everyone's super, no one will be. <laughs> there you go. There you go. To piggyback off of that super, super quick, like there's even a place for the old animation styles. Like I could see a movie being made mm -hmm. nowadays with the old Lion King animation style and it would do great. Invincible, I think, is an example of that. Now, it's not the craziest animation, but it is just awesome to see what they can do with that sort of 2D animation. There's no limit mm -hmm. to like what has to be done nowadays you can use old technologies to make something yeah. awesome that's one of the advantages right of animation is that versus cgi like you look back at the prequels and you know sometimes you're like man that cgi was rough that didn't age well the advantage of animation is it ages are just fine because it's not trying to look realistic and use this yeah. as just drawings like it has its own unique art style so it's timeless mm -hmm. it yeah. looks just as good as when it came out you had also brought up indie developers and usually people on their own deciding they want to make a video game. The amount of technology that is available now, mostly for free, as I'm in this space and understanding all the technology, is really amazing. And I think it is going to lead to more one-off hits like Lethal Company is my is my go-to example for that. It's just, yeah. it was a, a kid who just wanted to make a fun game. It was multiple, he had tried multiple other times to make a game, and then this one just took off. Like, it was a cheap game, it was fun, it was buggy, yes, but people had a lot of fun, and... Man, the 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 little the small creators are going to be thriving in these next couple of years. I think I said that I predicted that in a couple couple episodes ago, where the the small standouts are going to really stand out in the future. I think the last thing I want to say is talking about going back and fixing problems, whether it's bug fixes, whether it's changing content after it's released, whether it's streaming or movies, like anything in between. Is it an attempt to cover up problems where the problems are so obvious that it's embarrassing that they're seen, or is it just trying to hide what 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 you realize is a bad decision, whatever it may be? Maybe it's a little bit of embarrassment. I doubt that movie directors get embarrassed in this in that sort of sense. But again, why is it being changed? Is it improving, or is it just because you felt like it? Just throwing that out there. I don't know what the conversation. I don't know what that. I don't know what where that goes because part of it is like. Yes, we always want to cover up our problems. That's that's how we are as humans. Um, that's what whiteouts for. <laughs> but the the moral of this episode, there we go, is is that we don't need to hide our problems with Jesus on our side because he has covered all of our sins and we don't <laughs> Oh my goodness, someone mute him, please. <laughs> Did you say someone I know, mute I know, him? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's in charge of this call, so I guess no one can mute him for himself, but oh my goodness. Uh, that's, that's my takeaway from this. Maybe there's more conversation to be had. I want to know why they took out Blue Jean Guy. That's what I want to know. I, w I want to know why I they know. took him out, because, like, why? I don't know. Because what? That's that's what I'm saying. Well, that's where I got the embarrassment thought, is, like, are, well, were they embarrassed that they made a mistake like that? I feel like it would have been better to keep it in. Here's the thing. The internet exists, so everyone knows that you made the mistake. That's what I'm saying. Because think about how many people went and watched that episode to find exactly. that. Exactly. It's driving views up, getting you money. It gave the Mandalorian a bunch of free publicity. Why would you take it out? Yeah. Oh, you're right. It's not even that bad. And it's and it's like a really action-packed scene. Not a lot of people notice it until they started drawing attention to it on the internet. So yeah, I think that things like that actually are are more publicity to try and get people to go be like, oh, what's it? they changed that over there? Oh, I might might go see that. Things like that. Yeah. So yeah, publicity, free publicity. Even even for Cyberpunk, did they did they release an unfinished game so they got a lot of attention? Sonic the Hedgehog, did they release a very terrible version just for the that's, trailer? Oh, that's This is my conspiracy. I believe in this conspiracy. They made a really terrible looking Sonic so that everyone had eyes on Sonic. They said, "All right, we'll redesign," but they really had the perfect version the whole time. And then all eyes are on them and then they got a big thumbs up from everybody. That's my conspiracy for for how that movie was released. I fully believe that too. <laughs> 
there's a lot more to be said, but hopefully we can discuss it on our Discord because that's a great place. Make sure you go follow us over there, follow us on all our social, share this with your friends, rate us five stars, whatever you need to do to make us look good. <laughs> Until next episode, know that you're loved. God bless. Peace out, brethren. I'm assuming Deacon doesn't want to say goodbye to an uh, inanimate object. No, I, I refuse. <laughs> After the okay. last fiasco, I wouldn't want to remake that classic extended outro. It wouldn't live up to the original. I know. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you can. <laughs> wow. There it is, full circle. <laughs> the time to drop it. Nice. I like that. All right. Mm-hmm.